Hello friends and welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. And boy have I been looking forward to this. We're done Zelda 1 and 2, so we're finally able to jump into one of my all-time favorite games, A Link to the Past. Every time I boot this game up, it's like visiting an old friend. I adore it to bits. And I still hold firm that it is one of the best games in the series. I don't think it's controversial to say that this was the point in which, after a raw Rocky first two games, they got it right. A Link to the Past establishes a lot of series staples, including the freaking Master Sword, and it takes what worked in the last two games and does it all better. So unlike my videos for the NES titles, which covered all of their games' respective dungeons in a single video each, there's finally enough diversity to talk about here for me to actually break this up into a dungeon per video. Just like with the other games, that we've already discussed. Some of these may be slightly shorter videos, I might combine some of them into one, we'll see how it goes and what feels right. But before we step into the game's first dungeon, there's a few pre-dungeon things to get out of the way, as usual. Just as I did with the last two games, I am once again playing this game on Switch via NSO using the SNES controller. It just feels right, though I could bust out my childhood SNES cartridge, and let's be honest, there's no short of ways to play this game. It's one of those titles that Nintendo just seems keen on releasing and re-releasing on every single one of their platforms, and I'm okay with that. But for the sake of convenience and picture quality, this is how I'll be doing it here. This game also leans far more heavily into the lore side of things, which I just love, giving us this nice opening prologue, which you'll get by just fine without, but it adds a nice bit of flavor to the story. And I really can't stress enough how much more accessible to new players this game is over its predecessors. It takes a lot of those established ideas that I talked about last time, but streamlines it in a way that makes things feel far more balanced. Not every moment of this game is life or death, and I appreciate that change in pacing. The story may be nothing to write home about overall, but it's prevalent enough that it still works to drive things forward. It's that perfect middle ground. This game also features my favorite in-game keyboard, which might be a really weird detail, but I don't know, I just love how this thing is. The game itself opens in Link's house, as he receives a telepathic message from Zelda, who is held prisoner in the castle dungeon. So we immediately disobey our uncle's wishes to stay home, grab a lantern, and sneak out to the castle. And even before we've entered the castle itself, the game is subtly guiding us with environmental clues and NPC dialogue to point us in the right direction. It's all very masterfully done, but without ever compromising on the atmosphere of this scene. I could go on and on, in fact I'd love to, but where things really kick into gear is within the game's tutorial dungeon. Hyrule Castle. We may as well get into the dungeon design stuff, it's in the video title after all, so let's sneak through the outer gardens and drop down into the dungeon. Welcome to the series' first ever visit to Hyrule Castle. And this is how you do an in-game tutorial. You keep things engaging, you keep the lessons subtle, and you make an area that feels like a condensed version of how the larger game after this will play. That's what Breath of the Wild gets so right with the Great Plateau, and it's what this game gets so right here. Before we get into the design of the castle itself, just a quick side note about the music. I love it. The music outside leading up to the dungeon had this tense feeling of anticipation while the music was competing with the sound of rain, which was great. But as soon as we open the doors and set foot inside the castle, the cymbals crash, that opening bar kicks in, and the music just screams, it's time for business. It's just the right balance of feeling dramatic, dangerous, and triumphant. It's actually kind of incredible how far video game music had evolved between the first first two entries in the series and this game. Don't get me wrong, the chiptunes of the NES are iconic, but we have such distinct instrumentation here, it's masterful. I don't think we praise the Super Nintendo's sound chip enough for the time 
this was incredible. The castle theme is iconic and has the perfect atmosphere for this place. In fact, this theme is so good that almost every iteration of Hyrule Castle after this game would rehash it. There's moments that feel tense, uncertain, dangerous even, and triumphant. I love it. But how about the dungeon design itself? Hyrule Castle introduces to the player how combat and dungeons will work for the rest of the game in a streamlined and bombastic way. It's an exciting opening above all else, making subsequent playthroughs feel consistently fun to go through. So many other Zelda games have a tutorial issue, where I dread starting a new save file because I don't want to have to sit through doing chores like herding goats and bird practice. This game on the other hand, keeps things feeling engaging, so whether it's your first time or your 23rd, you won't find yourself bored or dreading a long slog of an introduction or tutorial to get through. This isn't a particularly difficult dungeon, but that is by design. It's not meant to be. It's meant to stay fun while teaching you how this game works. Right at the start, you get a sword and shield from your dying uncle, and get to fight a couple of guards, though you can just as easily skip right past them. So first we have an optional fight in a small narrow area, where you can't be surrounded or overwhelmed by enemies, with a small reward at the end of it, showing you that going out of your way is encouraged. Then we have to get into the castle through the front gardens, but the area is specifically made in such a way that there is a barrier between you and your enemies. You have to cut through the bushes here for any of them to be able to reach you. So it's all your initiative. This is combat on your terms you won't be blindsided. Then we get inside, and we have essentially the entire first floor to explore freely. This first section of the castle interior also has our first instance of another series staple, the Dungeon Central Room, which gives you a grounding point to keep yourself oriented while navigating. And I can't stress enough how important these become to dungeons after this. From here, there are several branching paths and different routes that you can use to reach your goal. So so the game lets go of your hand a little bit and lets you just play around and get used to things. But no matter which direction you take, you'll end up getting to the right place eventually. There's a fair amount of enemies here to fight, with slightly more powerful ones, and I do mean slightly, sprinkled around depending on where you go. But the place is littered with recovery hearts, so you're not really in any immediate danger. It's all a controlled environment for you to learn in, but it doesn't feel like it. That's the best part. So the game lets you learn by doing, by just trying stuff out. And the floor plan is essentially a giant loop, and while there are a few deviations you can make, it feels more open than it really is. You can even get out here onto the castle rooftops, but aside from a memorable hint towards a later scenario in the form of this energy barrier, every path will loop you either back to the front doors or loop around to the back stairs, which take you down to the castle basement. The only exception is the throne room, which we'll return to later, but for now, it's a dead end, forcing you back to the central room where you can try out another path. Essentially, the navigation here is set up in a way to ensure that you get to the right place, but it gives you a large explorable area and allows you to move about freely and figure that out yourself. Then we get into the basement, which is a far more linear section, which it has to be so that it can slowly introduce critical mechanics to you. First off, it introduces the dungeon map, which is thankfully back, and found in the this painfully obvious chest. We find our first locked door and key, which is dropped by the soldier in this room. Also, we can knock these guys down this chasm. <laughs> We'll also find our first instance of running into a locked door and having to take a minor detour to actually find the key, rather than it just being dropped by an enemy in the same room. It's only a single side room, but again, this is just them showing us that these are the tropes that the game will follow. So it's a deliberately simple take on the concept that later dungeons will iterate on. We also find our first dungeon item, the boomerang, which is pretty much optional here. Really the lantern that we get from home is far more critical, but the game is still showing us that we'll find and use important items. Then we'll have what is essentially a mid-boss fight against a ball and chain soldier. For an experienced player, this guy isn't that tough, but for any new players, he may pose your first very real threat. Once defeated, he'll drop the key to Zelda's cell so that we can rescue her. After that, it's time to backtrack with Zelda in tow. And look, a loop! I complained about the absence 
elements of these in Zelda 2, but here already we have a shortcut back, a loop in the path, to make backtracking that much more manageable. And I love to see it. Zelda also gives us a couple hints for navigation, initially telling us to return to the first floor, then upon reaching the central room, she says there is a secret passage in the throne room, which if you recall from earlier was the only dead end. We'll push the ornamental shelf aside, and then it's down through the castle sewers to escape. This section is a little less interesting from a design perspective, but gameplay-wise it is still very fun and engaging. It's essentially a dimly lit long linear path with no detours or deviations, but that's okay, we had a taste of that already. Instead, the game is now letting us master what it's taught us, by having us face different kinds of enemies, and by hitting us with frequent locked doors, and forcing us to thoroughly explore the rooms that we're in, solve puzzles, and find keys to those locked doors. I love that these passageways are so dark as well. The limited visibility just gives the whole place a more dangerous feeling, like we don't know what's ahead of ourselves, so we have to be extra diligent. What began as an infiltration is now a hasty escape. We can often light torches to temporarily light up the rooms that we're in, but those don't last, and you have to be thorough to find them, as they're usually tucked into the corners of the rooms. Maybe it's just my niche tastes coming into play here, but I love the enveloping darkness here. It's the same sort of vibe I found so captivating back in Varudania's first section, and I can't help but love it here. It does sort of artificially make us feel smaller than we are in these narrow corridors, and the results can be argued, but I personally just love the atmosphere of it. The only potential deviations from the main path here is a pair of bombable walls found in this room. We will be able to come back for them later, but for now, we have no bombs, and if I'm being honest, I'm not really a fan of that. I've already made this complaint in several other videos, but I hate not being able to get everything in a dungeon in one go. I don't want to have to come back here later. Overworld secrets? Absolutely, yes, I will happily come back for those when I have the appropriate items. But when they do this in dungeons, it kind of drives me bonkers. It's not the end of the world, though. The very final puzzle is a weird one that I'm not really a fan of either. You're confronted with a pair of levers to pull. One will open the door, and the other will drop a bunch of snakes on you. They're not that hard to deal with, really, but it's just a nuisance, I guess. There isn't a way to know beforehand which is which, so you just have to know or try them out. So on a first playthrough, that gives you just a 50-50 shot of getting it right. It isn't super unfair or egregious, but I just don't like the idea of having to play the odds like that, I guess. It's not the biggest sin, but not a design choice I'm fond of either. After that, we reach the sanctuary, get an earful of exposition, receive a heart container, and then we are set loose into the world. Sadly, there's no boss fight or anything of that sort this time around. But that's okay. Unless you count those snakes, maybe. Or the ball and chain guy? I don't know. So, that's the first dungeon of A Link to the Past. Maybe it's my nostalgia speaking, but overall, I really like this segment of the game. It's atmospheric, and it's a great introduction to the game's mechanics and design ideas. It introduces to us the first ever main central room, which makes navigation more manageable by having the various paths all branch off from one memorable focal point. It introduces to us its key system, first with a key hidden in the same room as its corresponding locked door, then having a minor detour to find the next key, followed by some contextual puzzles and a combat gauntlet. Essentially, we have a little taste of how open navigation will work, and then a little taste of linearity. And hey, as far as escort missions go in video games, the escorting itself is barely noticeable. And have I mentioned that it achieves all of this while setting up the game's narrative? I love this place, but I do have a couple of nitpicks. I think the sewer system that you escape through could be a room or two shorter, or at least have a little more variety with its locks and keys. Uh, maybe instead of arranging them in such a strict linear sequence, we could have at least one branching path or detour, but since the first half of the dungeon already has that openness, it's at least somewhat more balanced in that respect. I also wish the boomerang was at least somewhat integrated into the design here, 
somewhere. It could be something as simple as just having a switch we have to activate somewhere suspended over a pit or something. The boomerang is a series staple, and will get put to use elsewhere, but it feels like a missed opportunity to not have a use for it here within the dungeon it's found in. So overall, while the dungeon isn't all that challenging, that's sort of the point of a tutorial, isn't it? But few games get their introduction sections so right, either making their tutorials a slew of text, which can be overwhelming for new players, or just not making it very fun or interesting, which can be a total bore for returning players. A Link to the Past's Hyrule Castle never stops being fun for me to revisit though. Maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's because I get too much of a kick out of knocking these guys down these chasms though. Jokes aside though, I love how the game doesn't inundate you with an in-your-face tutorial section, but instead creates a carefully crafted environment that lets you play around in and learn things for yourself. That's the best kind of teaching a game can do. I never dread returning to this game because I'm so pulled in immediately by how engaging it all is right away. The dungeon design of this game is leaps and bounds ahead of its predecessors, and there's no better showcase for that improvement than right off the bat here in the game's opening moments. So while the dungeons only get better from here, this is still one of the best tutorial sections of any Zelda game. Thank you so much for watching this video. Before we end this off, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to my patrons and channel members, including, but not limited to, Grey Mage, Brenda, Tetra, Callie, Gail, Hylian Wes, Justin, Clifford Longhead, Midnight Naomi, and Bunny. Thank you all so much for the support and for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye bye!